So we are next going to start a new section, Special Divisibility Tests. This is an application of congruences. We have already seen a few things where we can use congruences, say to determine if an integer uh, divides another integer. But these divisibility tests will give us criteria which will uh, tell us that a given integer is say divisible by 9 when this happens. So such things we are going to find out, we are going to devise in this section. Now at their heart these tests depend on the notational system that we use to assign names to integers. And the most common one is of course the decimal notational system. In other words the decimal system where what we do we have 10 symbols. These are like alphabets, just like we have our usual alphabet in any language. Like that we have 10 symbols in the decimal system, which are these. These symbols in this order represent the first 10 non-negative integers. But then if you continue to name, give names or symbols to the other integers that come after this, you are going to use only these symbols. So the decimal system tells you how to do that. For example, the integer that comes just after 9 is 10. Now as an entity this 10 is something in its own right but when you express this in decimal system you use these two symbols in this fashion. You first write 1 and then you write the symbol for 0 and this number this integer gets this name 10 and similarly other integers also get names. Or looking at this from another direction, if you are given an integer, then there exists such a representation in this decimal system which will express this integer in, in a unique way. Now the fact is that this can be done not just for 10 but for other positive integers as bases. For example, you can instead of using 10, you can use the base 2. If you use that, in you get the binary system. You are probably already familiar with that. In binary system, instead of having 10 symbols, we have only 2 symbols, 0 and 1. Using only them also, we can express every integer in a unique manner using some kind of representation. So today we are going to prove that for any given base b which is a positive integer greater than 1, we can express a given positive integer as an expression involving powers of b in a unique way. Okay, so the statement is this. For any integer b greater than 1, every positive integer n has a unique representation of the following form n equal to a m b to the power m plus a m minus 1 
b to the power m minus 1 and so on plus a2 b square plus a1 b plus a0 where m is a non negative integer and a k belongs to this set for all such case okay then every positive integer has a unique representation of this form this is a claim and today we will prove this claim let me just see if i uh, have written everything or i missed something yeah i think it's okay that's all so let us now prove this claim. There are two things to prove. Given a positive integer n, that there is at least one such representation, that is the existence part, that there exists such a representation. And then the uniqueness part, that there is only one such representation. So we will first prove the existence. It's not necessary you have to prove the existence first. You can prove the uniqueness first as well. But the author has dealt with the existence first. So we are also going to do that. Okay. Now some cases will arise. Let us once more see what we are going to prove. B is a positive integer but B is greater than 1 and n is a positive integer n may be 1 okay who knows then n can be written as a combination of these powers of b where each coefficient a k belongs to this set in other words each coefficient a k is a non-negative integer less than b it can be at most b minus 1 so let us start. Now n being a positive integer may be less than b, it may be greater than or equal to b. Let us first see what happens if n is less than b. If n is less than b, now n is already a positive integer. And because it is less than b, it will belong to s. It will be an element of s. Then n belongs to s. And so we can write n itself as a0. In other words, a0 is nothing but n. And this is this representation. In this case, m is equal to 0. That's why we uh, kept the possibility of m being 0 by saying that m is non-negative, not positive, so that we include this case. Okay, so the process stops here itself if m itself is less than b. Next, let n be greater than or equal to b. Now what we do, now we apply the division algorithm to divide n by b by the division algorithm because we are going to apply it for the first time now. First time means in this proof, 
So we are writing this. We won't write it again and again. Okay. By the division algorithm, there exist unique integers Q1 and A0. So you can guess Q1 will be the quotient and A0 will be the remainder. Such that two things. First, N is expressible in this form and the remainder A0 is non negative and less than b. So note that a0 belongs to s. Let's write that. Note that a0 belongs to s. Now if q1 itself also belongs to s then we have expressed n in the desired form because this is again a combination of powers of b but q0 may not belong to s let us first write uh, what we will write when q q uh, sorry q1 not q0 if it belongs to s then we stop the process here itself oh but oh hold on hold on hold on not so fast okay i was getting carried away what is the guarantee that q1 is positive, someone may say, no, say Q1 is negative. How will you refute that claim? So we need to first show that Q1 is not negative. Q1 may be 0, but actually in this case Q1 is also not equal to 0. It will be positive. Let us first show that Q1 cannot be negative. Now suppose Q1 is negative, then what shall we get from that? You can multiply both sides of this inequality by B. Why? Because B after all is positive. In fact, B is greater than 1. Doing that, you get BQ1 or Q1B, same thing, is less than 0. Then you can add A0 to both sides. That gives you q1b plus a0 less than a0 okay but q1b plus a0 is n so n is less than a0 now note that we are under the condition that n is greater than or equal to b since n is greater than or equal to b so we will have b less than a0, but this inequality directly contradicts this one. This contradicts this. So our supposition is from, and that's why q1 has to be greater than or equal to 0. But at the same time, q1 cannot be equal to 0. q1 is not equal to 0, since otherwise n will be equal to a0. And being a0, n will be less than b, contradicting this. otherwise 
n is equal to a naught and a naught is less than b which contradicts this that means that q1 is actually positive so this is something we have come to know about q1 there is something else also namely the next claim about q1 is that besides being positive q1 is less than n it seems natural that this should be but let's see exactly how i am writing all these things in detail because uh, see uh, for some time we need to see exactly what is happening in the proof when we get used to the argument the further whatever we are next going to write we can afford to be a little sketchy there but at first itself if i suppress details then it, it will become confusing next or now n is equal to this since a not is non negative if i do not write a not here say i write only q1 b that means i am likely writing something less i say likely because a not may be zero okay in that case this is equal to this however if a not is positive then i am actually writing something less so that is why we have this inequality okay and so n divided by b is greater than or equal to q1 now you remember the condition on b b is greater than 1 and that is why 1 over b is less than 1 which is why n divided by b is strictly less than n in concluding this we have used the fact that b is positive n is also positive and that's why because this is strictly less than n this q1 will also be strictly less than n hence n is strictly greater than q1 so we have come to know two things about this portion q1 one of them is that it is positive and the other is that it is strictly less than n let us write those two things together so that we remember that is 0 is less than q1 and all uh, okay let me change the order of the things because other things are also going to next come n is greater than q1 and q1 is greater than 0 fine so q1 is positive and it's less than n but besides that now two cases arise one of them is that q1 is less than b and the other is that q1 is greater than or equal to b if q1 is less than b oh i forgot are we already uh, under the case that q1 is greater than or equal to no i don't think we considered the relationship between q1 and b we only considered the relationship between n and b right okay now so let's see what happens next if q1 is less than b then being a positive integer q1 belongs to that set s which consists of all the 
non negative integers less than b then q1 belongs to s and we can write in as q1 b plus a naught or uh, like this a1 b plus a naught where a1 is nothing but q1 so we stop the process here itself because both the coefficients a naught and a1 now belong to s a naught belongs to s and a1 is q1 which belongs to s as well but this is only one case what about the other case the other case is that q1 is greater than or equal to b but if q1 is greater than or equal to b then there exist unique integer so now what we are going to do we are again going to divide this time q1 by b just like we divided n by b when did we divide n by b to obtain this namely when n was greater than or equal to b then only in that case only we divided n by b to obtain a quotient and a remainder where the quotient satisfied these inequalities so if we are doing an exactly similar thing this time with q1 so we are going to get similar things similar results there exist unique integers q2 and a1 this a1 is not that a1 okay this is just the remainder such that q1 is equal to q2b plus a1 where a1 is non negative and less than b and as such now a1 again like before it belongs to s also mimicking the argument here what we did with n now we are doing that same thing with q1 we are going to get this q2 will be greater than 0 but q2 will be less than q1 now q1 is playing the role of n and q2 is playing the role of q1 but if you combine with these inequalities that one also then you have this okay so all these things we get just from the division algorithm itself Hence, now before we do anything else, let us use this expression of q1 here. So n now becomes q2b plus a1 times b plus a0. If we do the multiplication, we get q2b square plus a1b plus a0. Next comes that uh, part where we consider the relationship between q2 and b. If q2 is less than b, you see already we know that q2 is positive. if q2 is less than b 
then q2 belongs to s and we can write our n like this a2 b square plus a1 b plus a0 where a2 is nothing but q2 and our process stops because we have expressed n in that format in that form but if q2 is greater than or equal to b then it will continue let me write uh, one more step then there exist again by the division algorithm unique integers q3 and a2 do not confuse this a2 with this one that one was only for that case such that q2 is equal to q3b plus a2 where a2 is non negative and less than p so a2 belongs to s and let us use this expo we have to write the other things also no? also n is greater than q1 let me continue here itself q1 is greater than q2 q2 is greater than q3 which is greater than 0 and now if we use this expression for q2 in that uh, well not there but in the general one general one means the previous equation what was the previous equation the previous equation was this let me first write it so that i don't make any mistake q2 b square plus a1 b plus a2 so we use the expression for q2 here q3 b plus a2 times b plus a1 b plus a2 q oh sorry b square okay b cube plus a2 b square plus a1 b plus a2 again same thing if q3 because it's already positive if q3 is less than b it will belong to s and the process stops here where you can call q3 a3 otherwise the division continues now how far can this go on this of course has to end after a finite number of steps why because of these things these inequalities the sequence of these queues is a strictly decreasing sequence of positive integers and no such sequence can be infinite it has to be finite and that is why we are eventually going to come across some queue after which we cannot uh, continue the process since no sequence of positive integers can be infinite and strictly decreasing we must have a situation like this qm 
minus 1, we will come across some q which is greater than or equal. Oh, I should write, perhaps I write this for some m such that when you divide this qm minus 1 by b, that is your last division. Divide qm minus 1 by b to obtain new quotient qm and new remainder am minus 1 where of course am minus 1 is non-negative and less than b so that it belongs to s that is our usual pattern but or rather and this qm is no longer greater than or equal to b. It is less than b so that no further division can occur to give us yet another uh, quotient which will be smaller than even the previous one because the sequence has to stop now. At this stage, So by the time you reach this stage and keep on changing the representation of n accordingly, according to what each step is giving you, so you will get this expression for n. We will have n equal to qm b to the power m plus q m minus 1 b to the power m minus 1. Of course, no one can uh, actually run the process till m because m is general but one can look at the general pattern in which these numbers are appearing and from that one can guess that at this stage this expression will be had. Oh sorry, what am I writing? It won't be q here. It's so easy to get confused with these things. A m minus 1. A 2 b square plus a 1 b plus a naught. Where let us re-emphasize the fact that all these a's, a 2 also, A m minus 1, all these a's belong to s and q m also belongs to s. So all you now have to do is write a m in place of q m, just give it a new name. Take a m equal to q m. So that way you obtain the required expression. You at least know that, uh, I mean you know that at least one such expression exists. So this is the existence part. Now next we are going to prove the uniqueness part. In this part we will prove that only one such expression can exist. But before that I need a little ink. Let me complete this uniqueness part, proof, and then I will tell you something. Something about all these things. So now we go to the uniqueness part. Now for the uniqueness part, we will uh, approach the 
proof by the method of induction. We will suppose that there are two distinct such representations and then arrive at some kind of contradiction. Suppose N has the following distinct representations in the in that form one of them is say this one itself am b to the power n and so on a1 b plus a naught because we understand the pattern by now very well. So I don't write many tracks. But at the same time there is another one. Now you may have a little confusion which I also had when I first saw this. We are saying to possibly distinct, well not possibly, actually to distinct representations. But what is the guarantee that here also we will have M? There is no guarantee. In fact, you may have this integer, something else for the other representation. The integer that you will have in this representation may be smaller than this, may be larger than this. Whatever the case is, we can write this. We can have or we can take the same M by introducing extra terms with zero coefficients that means say in this c expression let me call this c expression of n uh, the m is smaller so that you do not i mean if you start from that side you do not reach this many terms but then you can introduce those extra terms by defining the higher CMs, how many you are going to need to all of them be zero. If the opposite thing happens, say this C expression has more terms than this A expression, you can then match their lengths by introducing extra zero A's. That's what we uh, express by writing this if necessary okay so that way you at least have the same number of terms on both sides but keep in mind because of this some of these cms may be zero or some of the ais may be zero. now we take all the things on one side and arrange the terms conveniently. This implies zero is equal to dn b to the power n plus you know what will come next dm minus one b to the power m minus one then d1b plus d0 where di is say ci minus ai or you can take ai minus ci also it's up to you I mean which side you are subtracting from which side for I equal to this. Okay. Now, what about this distinctness? 
in what sense are these two expressions distinct? If all the corresponding coefficients are equal, of course they are not distinct, they are the same expression. So that means there should be at least one i for which a i is not equal to c i. Since the above two representations are distinct, a i is not equal to c i for at least one i. Okay. And as such, that corresponding d i is not equal to 0. Let small k be the smallest such i. Because we are dealing with only finitely many di's, so there will be a smallest value of i for which a i and c i are different and that corresponding d i is not equal to 0. This means that this d k is non-zero and d something else where that something else is less than k are all zero. So d k is not equal to 0 and d i is equal to 0 for all of these i's. So these d i's will vanish from that expression. So the last equation above will change slightly. It will now reduce to this dm b to the power m and so on. So we will have till dk dk b to the power k. The other d's with lower suffix values are all zeros. Now we are going to manipulate this equation a little bit. So what we will do, oh it, okay, I will need to write another term because I am going to take one of the terms on that side. Let me write the penultimate term this and then after that we have dk b to the power k. Alright, so now if I keep this one on one side say dk b to the power k and take all the elements, other elements to the other side we will then have this. Now what we can do, we can divide both sides by b to the power k. Keep in mind that b originally is a positive integer and greater than 1 actually. So b to the power k is also a positive integer and we will have this. b to the power m minus k plus d k plus 1 because we are dividing by b to the power k so 1 b will survive. You do not have to worry about the sign of m minus k. It will be positive because we are starting from here no? and the other powers of b only have uh, larger and larger exponents. So because of this b, 
we next can take b common out from all these terms obtaining this m minus k minus 1 and the other terms accordingly will change plus dk plus 1 times b now from this equation it follows from this equation and the fact that b is a non-zero integer it follows that b divides dk now we go back to the inequalities that ak and ck satisfy now now something will go wrong Now we have these things. AK and CK both belong to that set S. So both AK and CK are non-negative integers and both of them are strictly less than B. Now, what can we say about AK minus CK from these inequalities? First of all, let me write the term here in the middle. AK minus CK is less than or equal to AK because CK is non-negative. So, if I subtract CK from AK, if CK is 0, nothing will change. I have equality. But if CK is positive, then it's less. Similarly, this is greater than or equal to minus CK because AK is greater than or equal to 0. So you can subtract CK or add minus CK to both sides of that inequality to obtain this one. Now, AK is less than B. CK is also less than B, so minus CK is greater than minus B. Alright. That means minus B is less than AK minus CK, which is less than B. This, however, is nothing but DK. Alright. So, the absolute value of dk is less than b. Now, the absolute value of any integer, you see, dk originally may be negative. Who knows which one of this is greater, which one is smaller. But the absolute value of dk is always non-negative. It's either 0 or greater than 0. Now, if this integer is positive, then it is less than b, but then how can it be a multiple of b? It cannot be. So it cannot be positive, it has to be 0. This combined with the fact that b has to divide dk implies that this has to be equal to 0, which implies dk is 0, right? This implies dk is 0 and this is a contradiction. What does it contradict? It contradicts the fact that we have chosen k to be the smallest i for which di is non-zero. So this is something we have come to a wrong, something wrong. That means our supposition must have been wrong all along, which was that n had two such representations. And that's why n cannot have two such representations. It can have only one. And we have already proved that it has at least one. So it has exactly one. So that concludes our proof. Now, what is the consequence of all these things? 
the consequence is the nice conclusion that you can express any positive integer in any base. So n can n is determined completely by the finite sequence a m a m minus 1 consisting of the coefficients of the powers of b in that expression a 2 a 1 a 0. Now because we know that powers of b are involved so there is no need to write that expression in detail all the time. Suppressing those powers of b we can devise a shorter notation to write n in that form and that shorter notation is this. What you do you just write these you juxtapose these coefficients like this. This doesn't mean product, okay. This means just the digits of n in the base b number system. To indicate the fact that the base is b, we write b here. Now, the simplest b that one can take of course is 2 because b needs to be greater than 1 so its smallest and simplest value is 2 when oh by the way this is called something now we call this the base b place value notation yeah we call this the base b place value notation for n and these are the digits of n in that notation. Now, so next comes these special values of p. So the fact here is that if your b value is small then an expression for n in that uh, place b notation like place value base b place value notation if b is small for a given integer that expression for n will be lengthy okay in, uh, involving many symbols the string will be large in length but if the larger b gets the expression becomes smaller when your b is small you have the disadvantage of having a large expression for a given integer but at the same time you have the advantage of using only a few symbols from the set of available symbols that capital s so you will be needing less number of symbols but the strings will be large. But if your B is large then your alphabet is larger in size. S is a large set. The expressions will be small but it will involve many symbols. Okay. So there is a plus and there is a minus. And the simplest value of B is of course 2. So the base 2 place value notation is, uh, I mean that system is called the binary system. And it's, uh, <clears throat> it has got this name from the Latin word binarius which means 2.
For example, in the binary system, if someone wants to express the 105, what shall we do? You see, 105 is an integer and it has already got a name in decimal system which we normally use. So that's why we have written 105. So already we are using one of these systems to even write this. But if you want to not use at, at this stage this name, you can write in words uh, 105 still you will be using in some sense you will be using the decimal system but you get the point that this is after all an integer now if you want to express this in binary what will you do this is your n so you go through that process now your b is 2 this is greater than b right so you divide this by 2 So you get this. The new portion 52 is again greater than 2. So you divide that by 2 as well. Alright. This is still greater than 2. Thirteen is still greater than 2. 6 times 2 plus 1. 6 is still greater than 2. So the addition, I mean, uh, division continues. 3 times 2 plus 0. 3 is still greater than 2. 1 times 2 plus 1. But 1 is no longer greater than 2. So this is your QN using notation from our original discussion. This is your QM minus 1. So you are going to take QM as your AM that will be the first coefficient. And then the other coefficients are going to be these remainders. Remember this is AM uh, minus 1. This is AM minus 2, AM minus 3 like that. So now we can write the expression. 105 in the decimal notation is going to be first 1 followed by this one. This is QM, this is a, AM, AM minus 1, AM minus 2, 0, then 1 followed by 0, 0, 1. To indicate that this is your decimal, uh, I mean sorry, binary uh, notation you write that 2 there let me see if I have got it correctly so 1101001 yeah on the other hand going in the other direction if a, a binary number like this is given to you say 100 followed by four ones This other direction is easier because you just have to express it as a linear combination of powers of 2. So what will be your largest power? You will have 0 here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So 1 times 2 to the power 6 plus 0 times 2 to the power 5 plus 0 times 2 to the power 4. Then 1 times 2 cube plus 1 times 2 square plus 1 times 2 plus 1. The last power of 2 and the smallest one is of course 2 to the power 0. So it turns out to be equal to 79. You see, we are so used to using the decimal system that whatever we end up having, we always write that in decimal. Okay, That much we are used to it. And that is why we often uh, don't even think about the fact that we are using some kind of number system. 
Now you of course also know that this binary system is most convenient to use in electronic computing devices. Where? Uh, because each expression is a string of zeros and ones. It's convenient to express these zeros and ones electronically using a switch. Zero represents the switch as uh, in its off state and one represents it in its on state. Or rather, the switch in its off state represents zero and when it is on, that represents one. Now, we of course usually use the decimal system. In the decimal system, everything is so easy. You know? For example, you take this number, say 1492. In the decimal system, it just actually what it means is this 1 times 10 cube plus 4 times. 10 square plus 9 times 10 plus 2, 2 times 10 to the power 0. That is also there. It is a little hidden. So following the notation that we have been, we have devised here, we should actually write it like this. But because the base 10 system is default so we do not usually write this 10 and this is called the decimal system because of this latin word decem d e c e m which means 10 okay and after this only after the this fact has been proved Next, using this fact, we are going to devise the divisibility tests. Not tonight, of course, in the next uh, number theory video. But let me now say something. Have you seen one thing that these are just some schemes, some techniques for naming an integer? Whether you express the integer in decimal system in decimal system it looks like this whereas in binary system it looks like something else right so what is an integer literally this itself is not the integer 105 but something behind it because in another system in another language it looks different and that's why the development of mathematics really does not fundamentally depend on these number systems. These are just some ways of expressing these things. And that is why your integer, any integer is really just something n. If you express this n in decimal system, it will look like this. In binary system, it will look like something else. In ternary system, where the base is 3, it will look like something else. So, while developing something in any area of mathematics, you should keep this in mind that these number systems are only for conveniently expressing or writing these entities or rather giving them some names so that we can recognize, oh, this is this integer, something else is some other integer, it is specifically that integer. It's only for that convenience that we use these number systems in the sense that these are number naming schemes. They are not fundamental to the development of any area of mathematics. And that is why sometimes you may see some proofs or some demonstration in some area of mathematics where say some fundamental property of decimal systems itself has been used. That proof, well it may be some convenient proof but that is really not a fundamental proof. 
some other proof can also be given which does not depend on any number system but depends on the internal logic of the system i mean whatever you are dealing with so keep this in mind this is a little philosophical but one should really understand that these are just what i can say some avatars of something okay say i am like this i may have multiple names the names are really not me but they just represent me in one form or another so these are different forms of the same entity that's what i wanted to uh, discuss after having shown these things but anyway so that's just it for tonight so see you in the next upload tomorrow itself we have something no i think it's uh, yeah tomorrow we are going to discuss functions for class 11 so see you with that until then this is me lucifer from a mathematical group have a nice day